Lord. Father, help us to understand what your word has to say to us. Help us to receive it, believe it. Help us to get it. And when the things of your word shock us, when the things of your word confuse us, when the things of your word distract us in a, and make us think of negative things, God, help us to remember that you're God and not us. And your decisions are good decisions. And your word is perfect. Help us to understand what you have to say to us by the power of your word tonight. And if there is one person here, even one, that does not know you, God, may tonight they get to know you just a little bit better by the power of your word. We plead the blood of Christ over this church and the spirit of the living God in all our hearts to lead and guide us in Christ and for the glory of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. Please give me your attention. A few things you want to know for you Bible studying scholarly type like myself who wants to know every detail. There's a few things that we know about here. First of all, that set phrase happens about nine times in this book when there was no king in Israel. There's two things that that lets us know. There was nobody leading the nation of Israel, number one. And number two, he's also letting us know that this book was written when there was a king. That's why some surmise that the book was written by Samuel, who appointed Saul as a king. You guys that are Bible students and Saul, and then who was replaced by anybody? David, excellent, who wrote the Psalms and many of the other parts of certain aspects of the books. At this point in time, remember, if you've been with us as we've been studying the book of Judges, we also learned that these chapters, 17 through 21, uh, the next few chapters, actually occur out of the time frame, out, out of the chronological time. So this actually happened more right before um, Joshua had passed away, and there's some indicators in there, just to give you a little background what had happened. Now what we're going to look at today is what happens to a nation when there's no leadership, or worse, when there's poor leadership. How bad does it have to get before we'll say, enough's enough? <coughs> Sound familiar? Verse 2. I'm sorry, the latter part of verse 1. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah, but his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there four whole months. Give me your attention. This guy is a Levite, which means if you're new to Scripture, that means he's a priest. There were 12 tribes in Israel, and one of the tribes, the, the sons of Levi, were called Levites. They were ordained to be priests to the nation. They were ordained to be like the pastors, and they were supposed to be leading and guiding now, first things first, the, the state of the nation had fallen so poorly, things got so bad, the Levites didn't have anything to do. Nobody wanted a priest or a pastor. That's number one. Number two, the whole attitude of them was so lax and so weak. It didn't matter that the Bible said, listen, you shouldn't multiply wives, especially you Levites. What's wrong with a concubine? Now, what is a concubine to you, younger folk or new to Scripture? A concubine was another wife that one took. Now, not just a sex partner. A concubine, according to Scripture, had certain rights and privileges. You were considered her husband. However, their children were not expected to have an inheritance with the other children. Are you with me? Now, you might say, well, wait a second. If the scripture talks about concubine, then obviously God okayed concubine. God neither okayed nor approved of concubines. God neither okayed nor approved of multiple wives. God simply told us, if you're going to have a concubine, here is how you must treat her. Same thing we looked at last week about slavery. God neither affirmed nor was okay with slavery. But God knew the condition of men's heart because when Scripture came out, men had already had concubine. When he released Scripture to the human race, 
He knew the state it was in. We've looked at this. The Old Testament is how to live a life that is centered around a relationship with God. The New Testament is how to live in a society that is not centered around God. That's what the biggest difference between the Old Testament and New Testament is. People always say, oh, it's a different God. No, it's not. It's the same exact God. Well, why is he so hard in one place and so graceful in the other? Same God. He's never changed. He is God and he changes not. But the nations, the people of the earth, have so perverted themselves before Scripture was given that he said, okay, you want to have slaves, at least listen to how you are supposed to treat a slave. Okay, if you're going to have concubine, let me tell you how you should. God never approved. You're not supposed to. Not supposed to have multiple wives, period. Concubine, it was your wife. She had certain privileges as being your wife, according to Scripture, according to the book of Leviticus, according to the book of Deuteronomy. But at no point in time was it okay with God. Are we understanding that? Well, he gets this concubine, his wife, one of his, one of his wives. Now, again, one of the signs that the nation is in deep trouble is when its leaders, its priests, and its pastors start doing, say, wickedness. You know, say, pedophilia. But it's okay. We'll just pay them off. Hey, isn't that pastor, isn't that guy get caught stealing money from his church? Why is he still leading his congregation? Hey, didn't that guy get caught having a, 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 an affair? Why is that guy still leading his congregation? Why? Because the church is too big. Can't get rid of him. Can't stop the money machine from rolling. That's why I don't believe in big churches anymore. I'm from a big church. I don't believe it. If I do something to cause me to be disqualified, and let me tell you, every day it's a possibility. The men of this church, they don't have to do very much to get me out. And I like it like that. I want it like that. Imagine if 50 families from our church were making their sole living from me paying them out of the money that came into the church. Now, if I fall, and so many people, unfortunately, the state of people are followers to a point where no matter what the guy does, they're going to follow him. It's the craziest thing. Men caught with their hand in the till, men caught with their pants down, men, and yet the people still show up to the church, and you're like, what are you, stupid? How could you follow that guy? You understand? The nation was in a really bad place. Like our nation is in a really bad place. It's getting worse and worse and worse. <laughs> you hear about the story from Oklahoma? Three kids, 15, 16, and 17, shot a guy. They were bored. It's a way to break the monotony up of Oklahoma. Baseball player from Australia, from, from uh, um, one of these towns in Australia, one of these provinces in Australia. They shot him in the back with a 22. And they caught them, and they said, we were bored. And you know what the scary thing is? Now, this might be a little bit of a curveball for you, but some of you, it might. I could have done that. When I was 14, 15, 16, and I was in the streets day and night, night and day, completely under the influence of, of, the, of the spirit of the world, that sounds like something I'd have done. Anybody else want to admit that? I mean, just... Brothers, you know what I'm talking about? That's just stupid enough stuff. I would regretted it later, but I was that stupid. Now, I don't know what comment that is on what we're looking at tonight, except to say the Bible says that there is a generation whose teeth are like swords. There is a generation whose fangs are like knives. And he wrote that 2,000 years ago, 3,000. What is happening to our country? 
And then you think about it, you know, I'm kind of done with this country. I really am. I'm kind of done with this country. I'm going to move to The world's going to hell in a handbasket. The world is going to hell. There is no place. We have the best place on earth right here, and it's going to hell every day. Are you with me? There is so much a commentary on what happens here, and I want you guys to see what happens. Unrained sin is a pit of desire that has no satiation point, saturation point. It is never satisfied. You understand me? Watch. Watch what happens here. So he gets this concubine. That's stupid enough. She plays the harlot against him. Maybe she prostituted herself. Maybe she was just sleeping around. Who knew? I mean, he's a bad enough dude as it, be as it is to begin with. She leaves him. She goes to her father's house about 100 miles away. She's there for four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and to bring her back, having a servant and a couple of donkeys. Now, first of all, that's a commentary. Now, this Levite, he was a man of means. Donkeys costed money. Servants costed money. So he had some shkaros. He wasn't hurting. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him and stayed with him there three days, so they ate and drank and lodged there. Now I don't know about you fathers, but if that's my daughter, you treat my daughter like your whore, and then you have the nerve to come here? No. The state of that nation was so bad. Oh, finally, somebody who's going to get my daughter out of here. Yeah, yeah. You know what you got to do? Stay here with us for a while. Stay here with us for a while. Hang out with us. So good to meet you. I heard all about you. The fathers in our country now, it's quite acceptable. They're 14, they're 15. Let them have sex. As a matter of fact, Nine-year-olds are getting birth control in schools now. Handing out condoms. Grade schoolers. Had a conversation with somebody at the gym this morning. Talking about abortion. I said, dude, just be honest. The same people who are for abortion are the same people who have no problem birthing the kid and killing him. What's the difference? would do the same thing. Come on. The guy, oh, that's not true. Well, why not? You doubting when life actually starts? Come on. Let's be a little bit logical, a little scientific. I said to my good friend, whom, I, whom, whom I've been training with now over eight years. Come on, bud. Be serious. If you're for abortion, you have no problem with the kid being born and killing the kid right there. I mean, the kid hasn't spoken. You haven't named it yet, right? Just be honest. You don't know what you're talking about. So listen, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let me tell you what the root issue is. It's not the abortion. It's not the pregnancy. It's the godless state of our society that tells them it's okay. And don't worry about it. Everybody's having sex. No, they're not. And as far as I knew, sex was still a choice. A choice. Just because you have the desire to have sex with somebody of the same gender doesn't mean you have to follow through with it. I remember being a young man, growing up in a very sexual society, growing up in the 70s. My parents, free spirits, swingers, wondering if I was gay. Since so many of my fathers and mothers' friends that were men just always touching on me, man. It's, Maybe I'm gay. I don't know. Oh, gay men seem to just like me. Maybe I'm gay. I don't know. I was just a kid, 14, 15 years old, still prepubescent, wondering. Well, they're so nice to me, though. And women were very intimidating, especially my mother's friends. They wanted to do more than touch me. Maybe I'm gay. Nobody was there to help me, to straighten me out, to talk to me about these things. Really, 
you're bombarded. Now all of a sudden your hormones start to rage and you're 15 and 16 years old and you're bombarded with sexual things, man. Your brain is like a cesspool and you can't carry them out. And you, you must be, there's something wrong with me, you know? And when you're alone, you do the stupidest things and the craziest things and you look at and touch and you... I must be... I must be crazy. There's something wrong with me. No! My young brothers, there's nothing wrong with you. God has got a wife for you. God has a husband for you. Wait, and He will bring you joy, unspeakable joy, and pleasure beyond any sexual experience. Control yourself. The desires you have are normal. They're normal. Controlling them is important. And know now, young brothers and sisters in here, especially you young brothers, if you're already on that computer pointing and clicking at those images, you're killing yourself. You're taking a big old needle full of death and you're sticking it in your heart and you're pushing death. Every time you do that, you're pushing death into your heart. Just know that. Know that now. You're ruining already what God has meant for beauty. You're ruining already. Just know it. Every time you do that, death, and you fill yourself up with death. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank, and they lodged there. And just so you know, that language there in the original language is they partied hard. Apparently this Levite didn't know that priests and prophets and pastors weren't supposed to be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. So they partied, man. Three days worth of partying. Verse 5, Then it came to pass on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning, and he stood to depart, but the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. So they sat down, and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night, and let your heart be merry. And when the men stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him, saying, So they lodged again four days, and he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, but the young woman's father said, please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon and both of them ate. Now, I don't know whether the guy was just like, man, this is a good guy. I don't know if he had some bromance happening with him. I don't. <laughs> but apparently, the woman's dad was like hardcore into partying. Now, I don't know if he was afraid for his daughter to leave and hoping to talk to the guy in the stand. I don't know. We don't know until we get to heaven and ask. We don't know. But one thing is for certain, he just wanted to keep this guy drunk and happy. Verse 9, when the man stood to depart, and he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is now, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here, that your heart may be merry. Come get drunk with me some more. Tomorrow go your way early so that you may get home. Here he says something logical. He says, listen, it's the middle of the day and you got a long ride. If you leave early tomorrow morning, you'll get there and it'll still be light. If you leave now, it's going to get dark. So stay. But you know what happens? Let me tell you what happens, parents. When you fill your kid's mind with so much crap for so long, all of a sudden you want to tell them something that makes sense. And they're like, forget you. Forget you. You want to tell me what to do? Look at your life, Jack. You want to tell me how to run my life? Why don't you do yourself a favor? Get your own life straight. I ain't saying that's right. I'm just saying that is. Here he finally made some stinking sense. And the guy's like, oh, you want me to listen to you now? Verse 10, however, the man was not willing to spend that night. So he rose, departed, came opposite Jabez, that is Jerusalem. Now again, pointing to a time that this is the land of the Jebusites, it's called Jebus, that later 
after the Jews inhabited it, became Jerusalem. Extremely germane to the rest of the book because we know that Jerusalem is the epicenter of the entire earth's spiritual context. Jerusalem became the center of the universe, still is to this day, continuing. With him were the two saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. They were near Jebus, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, please, let us turn aside into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into the city of foreigners. We are not of the children of Israel. We will go to Gibeah. Please give me your attention. So important. This priest, who we now is totally, you ready? Completely blew his witness. Oh, but he doesn't want to stay in a city of the, of the Jebusites. Because let's still follow the Bible. Let's not hang out with them. Let's at least find Gibeah where there's actual Jews. Do you know how often I see that? Coming from a Catholic background... Coming from a, my mother being Jewish, the cussing and the fussing and the wild living, but let's get, you must obey the Sabbath. <laughs> Live like hell during the week, but make sure Sunday you're in there getting your cookie. Like, are you serious? <laughs> so crazy. We've got to be careful not to do that ourselves, guys. I met with a guy a couple of weeks ago. It was about a week and a half ago. This guy I knew from church back in the day, and now he's working at church. And I said, bro, congratulations. That's wonderful. You're in what they call full-time ministry. Oh, man, I'm learning so much about the Bible. He said, and he's telling me about a pastor. He, he just names a verse, and he can quote the verse back. I don't know what to say to dude. It's like, listen, I didn't say anything, but when he walked away, I think it was Austin I was talking, I said, isn't it sad? They think that Bible knowledge is spirituality. They think knowing the Bible makes you more spiritual. And it's a good gateway, and there's nothing wrong with knowing the Bible, but let me tell you, if you have not love, what do you got? Nothing. Nothing. Give me a new believer who just loves Jesus over somebody who's been walking with the Lord for 20 years and knows Scripture but has, no, has lost their ability to sacrifice. Has lost their desire to suffer. And it, let me tell you what, it's happening everywhere. It's happening everywhere. Me and uh, our church got into this big fuss with another church because they sent out uh, Compassion International, the guy that runs Compassion. How many of you have heard of Compassion International? With the kids, they send out the cards and the kids. And the guy that runs it, the uh, CEO or whatever it is, he's going out to do a talk, and he wants you to show up and invite the church. And I sent him a letter. I said, as long as he makes $300,000 a year, he'll never come in my church. And I sent it. <laughs> I sent it to everybody that was on the email chain. <laughs> and I got a call back. Why would you do that? It's like, why would you do that? If so-and-so, pastor so-and-so approves of him, then we should. I said, approve of a man who makes $300,000 a year and says he's in ministry? And you know what their excuse was? That is less than 1% of the amount of money that they take in. This man's figurehead, this man's personage, he causes people to donate. Shouldn't he be compensated for how much comes in? I said, are you crapping me? That's what you believe? I said, he'll never be in my church and I will never attend anything from him. And I pulled all my support from Compassion International. If you have kids in Compassion International, we'll show you a ministry that 95% of the money that you send to them goes to the kids. 95%. What's the name of that again? The one we've been supporting? Pathway to Joy. Pathway to Joy. Karen and Cornell Bukur in Romania is one of the missionaries we support, Pathway to Joy Ministries. They send you pictures of the kids, and you see, not just the, you know, they send you a picture and a story, and you'll get letters from the kids. Wonderful. 95% of the money goes to the kid. 
5% is the paper that you're reading it off of. Yeah, let's do that. Let's not call nobody out. Let's let them just be. Let them, you know, Ryan, why you got to be so, so, finish the word. You. <laughs> Holier than thou. Whoa. I don't claim to have nothing down. But my brother's got a speck in his eye. I'm going to try and help him remove it. If he wants to stick more specks in his eye, that's not my business. Then he's on his own. But when he calls me and asks to come to my church or asks me to go to his church, and you think I ain't going to call him out? Sorry. And I'll tell you why this is, guys. This scripture verse is to support the fact that as a teacher of God's word, you are held to a higher account. And your name could be blotted out of the book of life because of it. Your name could be blotted. As a teacher of God's word, you can lose your salvation. Oh, wait a second. Are you talking about new doctrine? I'll show you the scripture later. And I know it keeps me straight every day. I know it keeps my pants on every day. I know it keeps my hands in my pocket when they need to be. I know it keeps me, and that thought keeps me straight. I just want to sometimes go with it, you know? I see people in a congregation, and I want to just, oh, man, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. I, I want people to like me. I'm not a totally I don't care guy. But I want God to be pleased with me more than I want you to like me. And hopefully you're the same way. Continuing this foulness of this wicked story. Um, however, the man was not willing. Verse 11. They were near Jebus in the days of far spent. The servant of his master come. His master said, verse 12, verse 13. So he said to his servant, come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. And they passed by and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to the Benjamin, which belongs to Benjamin. Benjamin, remember, was the father of one of the tribes, a small tribe, 30-some-odd thousand in this tribe. This was their area that they took. Benjamites also happened to be a very powerful bunch of men. These guys were warriors. They turned aside there to go into lodge in Gibeah, and when they went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. First of all, give me your attention, please. Let me give you a little background of the time. In the Middle East, even to this day, hospitality is extremely, not only religious, superstitious. To take somebody into your house was a good omen. To take somebody, a stranger, into your home was you were safe. When you went, it, they would fight. Oh, no, you come and stay with us tonight. We will feed your horses. We will take care of your servants. You were safe. It was major. I, I tried to think of some things like it was in our society, in our day and age, but I couldn't think of any. But listen to me. It was extreme. But yet they came into this city, the city of Jews, Benjamites, and nobody would take them in. It reminds me of another story of a couple of people who went to Jebus, which is now Jerusalem, and nobody would take them in either. And she was like pregnant and all. And they had to spend the night in a stall. And their baby was born, and they put the baby in a manger. You know what a manger is? That's a trough for feeding cows. Remember that story? Totally different, though. Oh. They passed by and went their way. They turned aside in the lodge of Gibeah. No, nobody would let them spend the night. Just then, an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. So he was there working. He wasn't actually a Benjamite. When he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. The old man said, where are you going and where do you come from? So he said, we are passing from Bethlehem into Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah. Now I am going to the house of the Lord. But there is no one who will take me into his house. Although we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant and for the young man who is with your servant, there is no lack of anything. The old man says, hey, what are you guys doing? What are you, what are you doing here? 
And that you could read it with almost a panic in his, like he knows something. What, what, what are you doing here? Just listen, nobody is going to take me in. I don't know what's, what's wrong with this city. I mean, are we still in the territory of the Jews? I mean, is this, is this still the nation of Israel? I mean, I certainly passed by the foreigners who would have taken me in. Here I am in the Benjamite city. Nobody takes me and he says, he says, I'm not even asking for nothing. I got plenty of food for my servants. Matter of fact, I got food for your servants. I don't need you to feed my horse. I can feed my own horses. Then the old man said, Peace be with you. Shalom, he says. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. So he brought him into his house, gave fodder to the donkeys, and washed their feet, and ate and drank. Ah, oh, what a nice story. I wish it ended there. I really wish it ended there. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. What? The men of the city saw the man go there, but night came, and a funny thing happens at night. The freaks come out, and they bang on the door, and they say, hey, we saw that dude come in. You sent him out here. We want to have sex with him. Excuse me? Hey, guys, I don't want to be mean to any people group, but let me tell you something. This whole gay marriage issue, it irks the crap out of me, and I'll tell you why. Because God ordained marriage. And the vast majority of the people I know who are for gay marriage don't want nothing to do with God. They just want what you have. And let me tell you, what they're searching for is not satisfying. And the proof positive is now that gay marriage has pretty much been passed and almost and will be passed in the rest of our country, you think that's going to be enough? You think that's fine? No. New legislation has been passed. You know what the next thing is? Multiple wives. Mormons have already introduced legislation. If they can have gay marriage, we want multiple wives. It should be legal. It's our preference. Oh, but that's not all. New legislation right behind that. And guess what it is? Pedophilia. There's nothing wrong with adults having sex with children. They were born for that. What are you trying to say? It's already introduced into legislation. They want lighter laws. It's never going to be enough. And left unchecked, guys, this is what's going to happen. And this is already happening. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like another story? Another place called Sodom and Gomorrah. Bring those men out. Except those men, they had these angels that protected them. You know what the sad part of the story is? No angels of protection here. No guardian angels. So what happens with the story? I don't even want to finish it. Verse 23. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly, seeing this man has come into my house. Do not commit this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do to them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. Huh? When... Preference becomes superstition, becomes void of God. Then the act that you're trying to do for the right reason then becomes the wrong reason, and then everything you do to support that afterward is wicked. Don't touch them, these men, this man, because it's a bad reflection on me. Instead, take his wife and my daughter. Wow. Take my wife. Take, his, take my daughter. Take his wife. Take my daughter. I don't even know a commentary on this. 
I, I can't fathom. I, I want to put this. I want to put this in your brain to make you understand this. Listen. Let me put it to you this way. When our nation was first birthed, there was a French guy. I can't remember his name, but he said something. He said the nation of Americas will fall because once you in, enact, once you vote people in to do the will of the people the people will then vote only those in who can help them and these men will take advantage of them. Let me explain this to you. Our country was founded on the basic Judeo-Christian values and principles, the Bible. And when you were enacted, when you were in, put in office, you were to put your hand on the Bible and say, no, above the, need, above the wants of the people, I will give them the needs of the people. And as a nation, we believe that the needs of the people are right in this book. But when you move away from this book and now the people can vote for you to give them stuff, they will vote in people who give them what they want, not what they need. Do you understand? We don't live in a democracy, in case you guys didn't know that. We live in a republic. A representation of the people was given, like the people, to give them what is needed according to Scripture, not according to want and desire. Of course we have the president we have. Of course we have the government we have. Give me more, give me more, give me more. Godly capitalism is the only way to a prosperous society that takes care of the poor. Godly capitalism. This is what happens right here. And let me tell you something. This is not just historic, it's prophetic. We are headed there. We are headed there. Has anybody ever been to a gay pride parade? I'm from New York, Manhattan. You've never seen the sickest things in your life, and you're going back 30 plus years. When they walk down the street in their G-string, leather studded, whips and chains all over them, hairbrush, and they, we just want to F your children, we just want. And you're thinking to yourself, and I'm supposed to accept you for who you are. Uh, and then the guy comes out with his suit and his tie. I'm a gay man. And there's nothing, no reason you shouldn't accept us. And you say, I got no problem accepting you. It's the guy with the G-string studded underwear that I have a problem. <laughs> and you say to that man in the suit and tie, Will you denounce that man? He's gay, I won't do it. Let me tell you, my black brothers and sisters, this goes for you too. If you are voting for somebody based upon the color of their skin, shame on you. And when those people say up there, and they get up there with their suit and tie, and they tell you why there's nothing wrong with Jay-Z, and there's nothing wrong with these rappers, and, so wait a second, they're infecting your people with poison. Speak out against him. No way. Why not? He's black. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I'm white, and I speak out against any man that is for abortion. I speak out against any man that is hurting children. I don't care the color of their skin, the state they come from, the nation they come from. No, 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 no. Now, I've had, I've had this discussion with some of my black friends that are pastors, and they, and they say, Ryan, you just don't understand. You've never been black, and you never will be. You don't know what we went through. And I say, bro, you're right. You're right, and, and, and I can't understand. But you ain't the first people to be enslaved, and you weren't the worst people to be enslaved. Oh, yeah, what is that supposed to mean? The Jews, six million of them were killed in an oven 60-some-odd years ago. What are you talking about, man? You weren't the first people to be enslaved, man. The richest woman in America is black. The president of the United States is black. The systemic racism that you speak of, overcome it now. If we don't start speaking out against it, here's where we are, guys. Here's where we are. 
those men that came in your house last night, bring them out. We want to have sex with them. No, 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 no. Take his wife, take my daughter, but don't touch them. Why? It's bad luck. Where is, and where's the Levite? Over my dead body. How come he's not out there with a sword and a club and over my dead body? Where is this guy? Where do you see where he is? This is great. You'll love this. No, you won't love it. Verse 25. But the men would not heed him, so the man took his concubine and brought her out to them. So the man took his concubine, and they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. They gang raped her all night. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. When her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, there was his concubine following the door of the house with, his, with her hand on the threshold. So she had tried to get back in the house. Her hand was at the door. It's okay, because he had a good night's sleep, right? My wife watched a guy on TV whose 15-year-old daughter a couple years ago got shot. Couldn't come off his political beliefs. Your daughter got shot by drive-by shooting in Chicago. Ah, will you speak against it? They, he wouldn't speak against them. He wouldn't do it. Well, I'm for stricter gun control. And he says, don't you understand that Chicago has the strictest gun control laws in the country? It doesn't work. He couldn't come off of his political affiliation, this whole liberal democratic talking points. And, and the guy's like, your, your 15-year-old daughter, she wasn't a thug. She, you had to see a beautiful smile. She was an honor roll student, ready to go to college. But he couldn't do it. And this is what it reminds me of couldn't come off his craziness. I'm almost finished, guys, because <laughs> it gets worse. And he said to her, get up and let us be going. Get up and let us be going? You had your fun? Your wife just got gang raped for the last eight hours. Get up, let us be going? But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey, and the man got up and went to his place. When he entered the house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her into 12 pieces, limb by limb. What? The language means piece by piece. And I looked at my body, and I thought, OK, cut her hands off, cut her arm off, cut her shoulder off. 9, 10, 11, 12. Just, just, he probably left the torso aside. He cut her up into 12 pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, no such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. Now he's full of outrage, right? Yeah. Sit back and do nothing when they gang rape your wife. And now you're appalled. So he did something. He cut her up into pieces and he sent her, he sent her body parts to the 12 nations, to all the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent it out because he wanted to shock them. He wanted to wake them up. Wake up! This is going on in Israel. Isn't it great? I love that. The people who speak out are the ones that are most guilty, too. <laughs> you close your Bible. Next week, we're going to see how he called a meeting. And finally, something woke these people up into getting together. And what happens is, <laughs> read it for homework. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. But the picture of how closely related it is to where our country is, it's scary. It's scary. Okay.
So I've given you all the bad news. What's the good news? Let me tell you the good news. You ready? Our side wins. Do you believe it? I said, do you believe it? Amen. Our side wins. And you're on the winning side. And you have a call in life. And your call in life is to bring as many people from hell to heaven. Don't invite them to church. Invite them to Jesus. You, Christian, that is here, the Lord Jesus is coming back. You're not going to see the great tribulation. You're not going to see those times. You will be raptured soon. But you have a job to do. You have a calling. You must invite people to the Lord. You must. This is happening. People are dying every day of their lifestyle choices. AIDS is rampant. People are dying. The world is going to hell. Pull them out. You have the keys to the kingdom. The good news, man. Jesus came to save sinners in whom I am chief. If he saved me, who at one point would have had no problem, I would have laughed with those kids. I laugh, I, 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 I scorn them now, but I'd have laughed some years back when I was a teenager. That's who I want to be talking to. Don't be afraid. You're more powerful. You got the spirit of the living God. You're supernatural. Until God calls you home, no weapon that's fashioned will prosper against you. And you know where you're going. You kill me, you only make me better. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, your word's a little crazy. Help us to make sense of it. Help us to understand how to apply it. Help us to see, as Paul wrote and Peter wrote, and you said that we are in the last of the last days. And when they say peace and safety, behold, destruction. Help us, God, to each and every person that's in here. May we be bold, be bold in our faith. May we share the love of Christ. May we not be so busy that we forget May we not be so work-oriented that we forget. People are going to hell around us, and we want to be there to drag them out of the gates of hell. Give us boldness. If you want boldness, if you want supernatural boldness, everybody's eyes closed, just raise your hand. Let me pray a prayer over you. God, for us who are raising our hands, we ask you to set appointments for us. Set appointments with our family members. Set appointments with our friends. Set appointments with strangers that we could share the love of Christ, even if it's just a God bless you. Just something that they would consider the cross with, God. For your word says that the eyes that look to you will never be put to shame. Your word says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. God, help us us to be bold. Give us supernatural appointments. May we not be too busy ever to share your love with those that need it. As the world looks upon us and goes down, may we pull them up. For your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. Praise God.